Welcome, everybody, to Redacted on this Wednesday evening. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And on the show, we hope to hold people, uh, powerful people, to account and cover the stories you might not see in the mainstream media. Uh, we've got a very, very busy show for you today. So before we get started, though, it's very, very important if you'd be so kind as to smash that like button because it really pushes us further out in the algorithm and helps us here with the live show. We have thousands of people here in our chat, and we'd like to welcome all of you. So be kind to everyone. No nasty talk. If you can, can you, can uh, you? sensitivity, yes. sensitivity, well, kindness, I mean, yeah, if just you keep, can. be constructive, you know, just be, be constructive, funny. be funny. funny is okay. Funny is always welcome. And if you can be constructive and funny, um, man, you're hit, hitting a home run. Um, we've got a jam packed show for you tonight. So we are going to talk about, um, a couple of big stories out of Ukraine that unfolded over the past 24 hours. We've got an update on that nuclear reactor site that was shelled by Ukrainian forces. Um, an update on the inspection process. Vladimir Putin saying, get these inspectors in here now. Uh, we're going to be speaking to an expert on that situation. We're also going to look at the latest out of Crimea and why Vladimir Zelensky is saying that you know they're not going to stop until Crimea is regained. For Ukraine, but Germany has some different thoughts about that. Uh, plus, we are going to talk about former President Donald Trump pleading the fifth. Um, this is not in relationship to the raid on his house, but it is. We're going to break all of that down. There's a lot to unpack there. And um, excellent independent journalist Kim Iverson uh, recently said goodbye to the rising she drew a line in the sand, put her foot down when she was basically told, hey, you're not going to be able to do an interview with Dr. Fauci because prob well, she wasn't maybe told that, but she was told it in a kind of a ghosting kind of a way. Um, we're going to dive deep into this story uh, with an expert. We've got a very special expert. Uh, on with, Kim Iverson. <laughs> yeah, this person is, a. I mean, I'm, if there's an expert on Kim Iverson, this person is the expert on Kim Iverson. So that person is going to join us in a little bit. <laughs> Uh, plus, we're going to talk about vaccine microchips. How do you like the sound of that implanted in your butt? No, not in your butt. Oh. See, if it was implanted in your butt, you might not ever feel it. You wouldn't. It well, depends. I might. Um, but no, vaccine microchips, uh, vaccine passport data, health data, people are opting in saying, yeah, go ahead, you know, just stick that into my hand and I'll never have to see it. It'll be buried inside of my body. Maybe we can put up a poll and see how many of you guys would actually go for that. Earlier, I, I teased that we have uh, uh, probably the foremost expert on Kim Iverson. A historian, if you will. A historian of Kim Iverson, um, but that person canceled. So oh. we decided instead we'd actually get Kim Iverson on the show to talk about the news tonight and join us live on the show. Kim, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I, I am the most expert person on myself, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the official biographer has joined us. <laughs> so glad to have you here. We're big fans of your work and we're oh, thrilled we're, we're thrilled that you'll be joining us for the hour. I, I say an hour. I always tell Natalie the show is going to be about an hour. Oh, but, he lies. But I yeah. lie. It goes a little longer. Uh, but we'll try to keep it tight. I was prepared. I was All prepared right. that it would maybe go two hours. So. <laughs> we appreciate it. I uh, hope you took a multivitamin yeah. today. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Kim's going to be joining us for the whole hour. We're going to be talking about a bunch of different big stories. Um, and then again, we're coming up a little bit later. We're going to talk about Kim's story and why why she left The Rising, um, what she's doing now with independent journalism. She's uh, she's going back to her, maybe back to her roots in some ways as an independent journalist. So can't wait to weigh in and get your thoughts on that. And also, Kim, we'll kind of throw you um, a little bit here because I wanted to talk maybe at the end of the show, we'll talk just about media in general, kind of collapsing mainstream media and the public faith in media that has been collapsing and love to get your take on that. Get your take on that as well. Before we get started, where can people, where can people find you? Uh, well, right now I'm just, you know, back to being independent. So you can go to my, to my show on YouTube, which is also on Rockfin, Rumble, and Locals. And that's just the easiest way to get to all of that is just KimIversonShow.com, which routes you to my YouTube channel, which is not ideal, but it is what it is for now. So that's where yes. uh, you can find me. All right, let's start with our top story, which is Ukraine and warnings about a po possible nuclear fallout starting to make their rounds. Um, I know it's like we don't want to be alarmist in the same way that Dr. John Campbell said, I, I want to be alarmist. Um, but when you have Vladimir Putin over the past 24 hours demanding that inspectors, UN Security Council and inspectors come into Ukraine and check the nuclear power plant, um, in this particular area in Zaporizhia that has been attacked, um, shelled by Ukrainians over the past few days, 
there is cause for concern. So here's the map. Let's just give you a sense of where this is. This is Zaporizhia. This is the largest nuclear power plant. It has six nuclear reactors in, in Europe. Um, of course, the big concern is that what would happen if this actually, with, you know, with, uh, with the materials, continues to blow across Western Europe, as you can see here on the map. Like this is, that's where it would blow. It would blow across to Western Europe. Yes. Um, Putin's Russia, call, Putin and Russia calling for an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council over repeated shelling of this nuclear power plant. And they took it back, of course, back in, they, they took it over at the early part of March last year. The nuclear reactor sits just west of the town. Zaporizhia, and it's been held by Russian forces since then. Moscow wants the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN nuclear watchdog, uh, to come in and take a look at this. Um, but at this hour, Ukraine is saying, no, we don't want that to happen. We don't want you to come in and we don't want you to look at this. No, but they're perfectly happy to allow the Western media to say that the story is true in the opposite, right? Um, so despite any fact checking, the Western media has run with this story the way that the Ukrainian government is telling it, but not offering anyone any opportunity to fact check or in investigate or inspect. Yeah, I mean, Kim, are you surprised by the so the Western media response to this, of course, is that 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 um, that the, the Russians attacked a nuclear power plant that they themselves have been holding since March. That makes a lot of sense, right. doesn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like suddenly, since they've had it since I believe March 3rd, suddenly now there's this imminent attack that is going to happen and, and they're going to go nuclear. Right. I mean, that's like literally what they're trying to say is that Russia is going to go scorched earth with this nuclear power plant. And it doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, why would they do that at this point? The Russians have been making slow but increasing gains throughout Ukraine, taking over territory after, you know, areas of territory. And so it doesn't even make logical sense why they would suddenly need to go scorched earth. So, you know, yeah, I, I do think that ultimately what this is looking like is it looks like Ukraine's attempt, and they've been doing this throughout the entire throughout the entire war, which is try to be, you know, sound the alarm in order to get more help. Hmm. So what they've seen is that the United States is not rushing in with troops as right. much as they wanted the West to come in with actual troops. We've, of course, supplied them with a lot of weapons. And I sympathize with their plight. You know, I sympathize if you are being invaded, you would try to do anything you possibly can. I don't blame the Ukrainians at all, actually, for even exaggerating greatly their situation to try to get anybody and everybody in. But everybody else needs to stop and say, are they exaggerating? I mean, we know they have the motivation to exaggerate. So it would be up to us to stop and say, is this a true real threat? And it just doesn't look like it when we're looking at a nuclear power plant that's been under Russian occupation since March 3rd. And then suddenly now we're in August and you know they're supposedly going to, to cause a real big problem. So. And then the narrative that Russia is saying, well, this is not true. So how about we w welcome in some inspectors mm -hmm. uh, right. so that the world gets this? The, the West just doesn't want to hear it. It's blinders on about this. Well, we just want Russia to be bad all the t in every way, right? Yes. It's, it's got to be that whatever Russia's doing, it's just bad, bad, bad. And they're committing genocide. It's sinister. There's no... You know, they're not, of course, if they're going to take a nuclear power plant, that means that they're going to try to blow stuff up. So, you know, that is that's kind of the mentality, of course, of Western media. And we just have seen that not be the case um, a lot of the time with what the narrative has been is, is has been off. So and so the Ukrainian media, if you want to take a look at some of the some of the fake news that's been floating around, um, this is some of the fake news coming out of, of Ukraine on this. Um, and what they'll say is, as a result of the actions of the Russian armed forces, the IAEA cannot verify radiation safety at the at the nuclear power plant. So they're saying that because Russia has control of it, that the IAEA can't go back in. And what they're also saying then is what Ukrainian sources are saying is, hey, we want full control of the nuclear power plant before we allow before we allow uh before we allow inspectors to go back in i sat down just a few minutes ago with uh former u.n weapons inspector scott ritter to talk about this and here's what he had to say scott were you surprised by the response the media response to this attack on this nuclear facility in ukraine well it, it, it's curious which attack are we talking about uh, i mean i know the media claims that it's a russian attack on 
a Ukrainian nuclear facility occupied by Russia, by the way, since March 3rd. So Russia is attacking itself. Or is it the Russian narrative, which has the Ukrainian military attacking a Ukrainian nuclear facility that's uh, currently occupied by Russia? Because that, that changes the, the, you know, changes the, the entire picture. Yeah, so I think let's go with the truth. I'm always on the I'm going to err on the side of truth, which is yes, the Russians have occupied this since early March. The New York Times would have you believe that then Russia was attacking itself with its own with its own troops. It was attacking the it, the nuclear facility while its own troops were there, which is laughable. So let's go with the truth, which is that Ukraine attacked this nuclear facility. What do you know of this attack? And then we'll get into the fallout surrounding this attack. Well, I know that the the attack took place on August fifth. Um, I know that the attack was um, was was predicted by none other than Anthony Blinken, the United States Secretary of State, um, who addressed the 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 United addressed had a press conference on August first, where he said. Those Russians need to be really careful about carrying out mortar and artillery and rocket attacks from the territory of this nuclear plant because there could be an accident. I think one of the initial spins was that, you know, there was an accident that Russia, you know, accidentally attacked itself. Uh, they accused Russia of creating a nuclear fortress. Um, you see, because the nuclear plant, you know, the Ukrainians would never attack the nuclear plant, never, because it makes no sense. It's suicide. Um, and, and, and so Russia was using this nuclear facility as a base uh, upon which to attack the Ukrainians. This is absurd. You know, the thing about the United States, and I say this as a veteran intelligence officer, is um, we're pretty good at collecting data. We're not very good at assessing data, but we're very good at collecting data. And one of the things I know we have this stacks of are photographs of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the Russian troop disposition there. So if Russia was actually using the territory of this nuclear power plant um, to host artillery, rockets, mortars, we'd have photographs on every evening news broadcast saying, hey, this is it. Arrows conveniently pointing to the artillery pieces. There's no imagery because it doesn't exist. There's a battalion of 500 Russian soldiers securing the plant. I mean, after all, there is fissile material there, and you don't want to just leave it uh, open to the public. But the plan is run by Ukrainian engineers, overseen, by the way, by the people who actually designed the plant, the Russian nuclear scientists, uh, experts in nuclear energy. Um, th th there's no issues here other than Ukraine is desperate and the United States is desperate to shift the narrative away from a inevitable Russian victory. What we're, what we're seeing here is anybody with a brain would know simply I could do this by looking at the rocket. You look at the rocket, they, they took photographs of it, and you orient the rocket to photographs, images, maps, and a convenient reverse azimuth points straight back to Ukraine, straight back to Ukraine. So there is no secret here. We know what happened, you know, and everybody who's involved knows this. There's not a single actor in this game who doesn't know exactly what happened. It's just that we are involved in information warfare, an elaborate diplomatic um, you know, bullying taking place at the United Nations right now through the International Atomic Energy Agency to try to do Ukraine's bidding. Uh, fortunately, uh, Russia is strong enough and in a good enough position on the ground not to really give a rat's you know what about what's going on. I'll ask you this to get oh, you out of here, which is the yeah. International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, of course. And this, uh, we were Russia, according to reports, saying, yeah, come on in, examine this, yeah. take a look at this, see what exa actually happened here. The reports are the Ukrainians are saying, no, we don't want you to come in here. And we don't want you to come in here until it's back up in full capacity and we have it back under our control again. What do you make of that? Well, the Ukrainians have... have long denied access to the IEA to the site because the thing about if you have international atomic energy inspectors on site uh, facts suddenly have to be taken into account um, and the IEA would do a damage assessment make an immediate immediate uh, report that the attack came from Ukraine the other thing that they would talk about is uh, the safe operation of the facility how the Russians actually have everything under control. The facility is fully operating. The only risk to the facility 
is the danger posed by continued Ukrainian attacks on uh, on the facility. That's the last thing the Ukrainians want. So they've come up with this artifice that says that the IAEA can only be credible if Ukraine controls the facility. That's just absurd. Scott Ritter, former UN weapons inspector. Um, Kim, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. So the idea that they know they, they, they get in there, they could immediately tell where these things came from. I mean, is that why they're keeping yeah. these inspectors out of there? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, and another reason is they just, you know, this has kind of been what Ukraine has said from the beginning, or at least well into this, um, into this war is that they've, you know, they've demanded that they gain control over all of these areas that the Russians currently have control of, and even areas that the Russians have had control of since 2014, like Crimea and areas of the Donbass. They've been saying, we're not going to negotiate, we're not going to talk, we're not going to do any of that until we want everything back, everything. And that, you know, obviously that's not working. That strategy isn't working. I mean, I just really wish that the Ukrainian government could just stop and self-reflect for a moment and say, you know, maybe it is time. I mean, the Americans are not rushing in. The West, they're not rushing in with troops. They're instead allowing Finland and Sweden into NATO. I mean, which is like a big finger to Ukraine in a lot of ways, right? To say, well, we wouldn't let you into NATO. Uh, but we're going to let all, all these other people in. And so, I mean, at some point, I feel like the Ukrainian government should stop and self-reflect and say they're not coming to help us. And we've been with Russia in some capacity or another, and they're our neighbor for a long time. So maybe it is time to just start negotiating mm. a peace agreement rather right. than constantly demanding for everything to come back into Ukrainian control. It's just not going to happen. Right. So people stop dying today, like right now. Right. This is something we've been talking about a lot. Now, on the heels of this Amnesty International report that showed that Ukraine, Ukrainian army has been willing to put civilians in harm's way, this sort of gives pause and makes us ask ourselves, well, would Ukraine be willing then to do something that damages this nuclear site? that would harm everybody, right? Is that a possibility? So just today, Dr. John Campbell on his YouTube channel, he was talking about how the possibility of a nuclear cloud or some kind of nuclear episode is not zero now. So we need to all sort of medically think, okay, what would we do in this event? Let's listen to what he has to say. I don't want to be alarmist, but there is a significant nuclear risk from a power station getting blown up in Ukraine. And this will blow a radioactive um, cloud or many radioactive clouds, potentially all across Western Europe and potentially Eastern Europe, but most likely Western Europe. The uh, reactor grade uranium has a half life of 700 million years. And no, that's not a misprint. <laughs> it is radioactive for uh, unimaginably long periods of time. So that's not awesome, right? Yeah, 700 million yeah. years. Wow. <laughs> and he's not an alarmist. I mean, we all, I think we're all fans of, of him. Right. And well, he goes on to talk about how if this kind of thing happens, right, then we need to avoid ingesting radioactive material that may come out of this region, right? So we're all sort of celebrating that now Ukrainian grain can be exported. Uh, but if there is some kind of event there, we're going to want to steer clear of that Ukrainian grain, right? So uh, this is something, like he says, it's not a zero chance. It's not a 0% chance anymore. I'm I sorry, think there's I actually even uh, even a, a fairly, I mean, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say high chance, but almost, you know, it's well above 0%. I just think as the Ukrainians get more desperate, as the government of Ukraine gets more and more desperate, I, I worry about what level they will go to in, or, and not only just the Ukrainian government, but just the West in general to demonize Russia. You know, as we're seeing the rise of Russia and especially Russia partnering with China and we're starting to see this sort of new alliance happening, I would I, I just don't. Unfortunately, I don't put it past our leaders to maybe to kind of make a calculation and say, well, um, you know, it won't hurt us. We're all the way over here. So right. maybe it wouldn't be, so, you know, yeah. But I, a I major catastrophe way, but. would rally support. So yes. 
Yeah. And it would demonize Russia if they could make sure that it was like, well, Russia did this. Then everybody in the world, in their minds, would hate Russia if they could prove that Russia was the one that did it. Right. And, you know, this is the thing, too. It's like no one would have access to that area afterwards to, to right. verify, to verify the story. Right. What what independent journalists are going to go to that area? It's not like you have you had one journalist during World War Two that was able to go to Nagasaki and actually confirm and, and witness it. An Australian journalist. That was it. They were kept out. You're not allowed to see it. Um, so really, really troubling. I guess if we like prepare for it, and we, you know, we're, I don't want to say we're preppers here on the show, but we have a garden and we, we try to we live have some chickens, we have some chickens and we try to live, <laughs> we try to live as closely as we can to the earth and try to actually protect ourselves in these situation, canning food and protecting ourselves. And Dr. John Campbell, again, who's not an alarmist, he's like, you should absolutely keep food on hand. Uh, preserves and iodine pills. and iodine and protecting your yeah. family. Again, this is, I mean, I can't believe we're talking about this, but I mean, these are, Chernobyl did happen, by the way. Like these things do happen. You know, three mile three mile island does happen. But and when you have a war zone where these nuclear reactors are sat, it can very much happen, right? And all you have to do is look at who benefits the most and who doesn't from something like that, right? So in order to figure out, because you're right, no one's going to be able to go and actually investigate and verify who did the attack that caused this horrible, horrific event. But all you have to do is look and say, well, who benefited from this? What would be the motivation? I just don't see any motivation whatsoever for Russia to be threatening anything of this sort. I mean, they are not, despite what the Western media says, they're not losing this war. You know, we've been hearing reports since early on that, oh, the Russians are just about to run out of resources and they're going to have to turn around and, and pack it up and go back home. And this is a giant failure. And I mean, we've been hearing this from the beginning and, and that hasn't been the case. They've slowly and methodically gained land. So why would they be the ones to do something disastrous? It would be those who are more desperate to try to, I mean, so it wouldn't be difficult right. for many of us to point the finger in the right direction, I think, but... But then, you know, of course, if we can't verify it, then, you know, here, here's the smears. We're all Putin puppets and right. We're all <laughs> Russian <laughs> propagandists. And right. I mean, right. I love those comments occasionally, like how much is how much is the Kremlin paying you for this show? And I was like, are you yeah. kidding? It's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's laughable. It's I'm ridiculous. waiting for my Kremlin checks. I mean, hey, I, yeah, you know, <laughs> then I'm going to get rich. Right. <laughs> right. If I got some Kremlin checks. paid in rubles. It paid in rubles, <laughs> which is worth more than uh, that is Kim Iverson from the Kim Iverson show. We're so glad to have her here. We're going to be talking about a number of big stories on the show. Um, I do want to talk about this next big story, which is another big Ukrainian propaganda story that we've been watching, which is the quote unquote bombing in Crimea we've been hearing about. You might have been hearing about this mysterious explosion, the Russian held area of Crimea. Um, let's go ahead and play some of this video. This is in an airfield, a series of explosions in the territory of the uh, Sakai mili military airfield near um, in western Crimea. Um, the defense ministry reported that there had been a detonation of aviation ammunition. Okay, so that's what it is, a very large detonation of aviation ammunition. As a result of the incident, one person was killed, another 13 were injured. Um, now, I want to be very clear. I spoke to a source this afternoon that told me there was no attack. This was not an attack. It was simply poor safety on the part of the Russians uh, at the munitions depot. Um, and so poor security, poor safety. And that's exactly what happened. So no Ukraine or NATO attack, uh, according to my sources on this, on this munitions depot. But the West, of course, is painting this as a sign that Ukraine is fighting back. And that this is a sign that Ukraine is about to go on the offensive in Crimea. Um, and Vladimir Zelensky, in an interview, uh, like clockwork, Zelensky comes out in this video message on his on a Facebook page where he talks about the Russian war against Ukraine, against the whole of the free Europe, began with Crimea and it should end with Crimea with its liberation. So Crimea is all of a sudden on the table, right? When we yeah. thought that that was not even we thought it was only the Donbass and the Donetsk region, but now um, it seems like he's put that on the table and uh, it seems like a dream. But like I mean, a, he said this before, this isn't like the first time, of course, and so. But now he's signaling it as, as a chip under which he will bargain with, right? Where it was not a bargaining chip for him before at all. Yeah. 
I mean, so, you know, and then you, well, I guess, I mean, he was saying before that this, like, we're not going anywhere until we get back the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And that includes Crimea, to which a lot of people are saying, really? Now, that seems surprising. Even Germans, um, uh, even, I'm going to pull up a German newspaper here. I'll try to translate my best German. My multiple years of German only served me so well. Uh, but uh, this is uh, Der Tagesspiegel. Um, Schultz, Macron, Draghi uh, are looking for a way out. That's what it says. Um, that's the that's what it says in German. Um, they are looking for a way out, basically, of this war in Ukraine. Um, and further in the article, it says, "Has the man lost his sense of reality?" Referring to Zelensky, the Ukrainian army is in retreat in Donbas, but President Vladimir Zelensky issues the slogan shortly before Mario Draghi, Emmanuel Macron, and Olaf Scholz visited Kiev. Of course, we will also want to liberate Crimea, Zelensky said, right? Dream of conquest. <laughs> Dream. So like he just sort of throws that on the table. Uh, Kim Iverson is joining us. He just throws, we're, we're glad for all of your help, glad for all of your money and all of your weapons. And, and, and oh, by the way, uh, we want to take back Crimea. Can we get, does anybody want so, dessert? Dessert? Yeah, exactly. So send us more weapons. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. he would need in order to even go about that task. Um, and yeah, it is, it, it is really, it's kind of mind boggling that he would think that Ukraine would be able to get back the land that they've lost during this war and then go back and try to get all of the land that was already lost in 2014, uh, when largely the populations in those areas don't want to be with Ukraine. They're fine. You know, they're, they're happy where they are. So it's, it is mind boggling, but I think it's really just signaling for, we need more weapons. We're going to need more from you. And right now we're on like a, a monthly auto subscription service, right? With, <laughs> uh, with Ukraine, just keep sending them weapons every single month, like clockwork. It's like rents do. Oh, yeah. got to give the Ukrainians a bunch of weapons. Meanwhile, you know, we've got all these problems here domestically. But I, I actually, you know, I do still question this, what's happened in, in Crimea, because I think I think that both sides have a reason to lie about it. So for me, it's really unclear what actually happened. Was there an attack or was it just, um, you know, just poor safety? Mm -hmm. I think that the the obviously the Ukrainians have a reason to claim it because they want to say, look at how strong we are and look what we're doing. So send us more weapons so we can do more. Right. But the Russians also have a reason to deny it because they should have weapons that are supposed to halt this kind of thing they should have you know uh say, i'm missing all my war terms at the moment all of the the different weaponry but anti shields, whatever it, whatever yeah anti-missiles yeah. right exactly that should be blowing <laughs> these things out of the sky before they even hit so that makes that's embarrassing for russia if missiles were able to get through or somehow attacks were of whatever kind it are uh were able to get through that's embarrassing to russia as well so there is a reason for them even Right. to lie about it so in this kind of thing we just don't know we just have to that's a great point i mean it would be and it really would be embarrassing because crimea this is not a new territory that that russia has been held, holding they've been holding it for years right. now and the fortifications in crimea are strong so if something if there was some sort of a western uh gps located uh guided attack by western intelligence which we know is the case right that's they're leading these uh these attacks throughout the donbass and other and other targets it would not be unreasonable at all for western intelligence to say hey here's a huge munitions depot we want you to attack with one of these high mars that we've sent you you know here's an opportunity right. to use these things we're guiding it for you 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 have them now we will launch it um but according to the sources I spoke to today saying, no, it was a safety issue as it relates to the munitions. But again, who knows exactly, right? I mean, it, it might, may very well have been a missile attack and this could be the catalyst. But I guess the proof will be in the pudding, right? Because we keep hearing about this big offensive that's about to happen, right? This big Ukrainian offensive is about to happen. It's never happened, but it's about to happen. So I guess once that does happen, that would be the proof then, right? Yes, but it's also yeah. interesting, this uh, faction of leadership inside of Europe that's saying we may just not have the stomach for this. We may want to tap out. We thought it might be an easy way to sort of support, uh, you know, autonomy in Ukraine, send some money and weapons for a while. But this is now dragging out six, seven months. And these European leaders don't have it in them. Yeah, anymore. specifically, I mean, Olaf Schultz, I mean, and and saying, you know, what are you guys thinking? Like, really, have they lost their sense of reality here that you think like Crimea is going back? Like, we'll go so far, maybe as the Donbass, maybe other parts of East, but the Crimea, come on, maybe you need to check that off your list. 
there was they actually put up a poll um, in this uh, in this uh, Der Tagesspiegel um, uh, website, and this is in German, but basically it asks: Should Olaf Scholz, should Chancellor Olaf Scholz, um, push for more weapons to go into Ukraine? And uh, the first answer is yeah. Yeah. yeah, Alf Jadenfall. Yes, yes, absolutely. 45% of Germans, according to this poll, say yes, they should send more weapons to Ukraine. And then if you look at the bottom there, nine, Alf Kainenfall. No, absolutely not. I want to know who the 45% are, but this is actually, yeah. this has dropped. This number has dropped, Kim. So there's support waning here. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that when people realize this is a forever war, and it's obviously a forever war because Ukraine has not set any sort of, I mean, for them to just say, no, we're not going to stop until we get everything back, including Crimea. I mean, that's so it's becoming clearer to people this is never going to end. And I think in particular Europeans, you know, they realize that Russia's kind of got them in a vice grip when it comes to their their gas, their natural gas pipelines. So they're right now they're fine. It's summer, you know, but once winter hits, I think we're going to see waning support. And people saying, you know, why didn't, why hasn't Ukraine gone to the table and negotiated this out? Why are we just fighting to the very last Ukrainian until they maybe try to gain? I mean, it'd be one thing I could understand, and I'd maybe even agree with Ukraine if they were gaining land back from the Russians right now. And they were like, right. okay, we're getting, we're getting it. We're making some ground, you know, we're gaining some land. So now that we've gained all of this, let's go for the rest. But they're losing land. And then they're saying, we're not going to stop until we get it all back. Yes. Yeah. And the news about, I mean, overnight, and we, I'm not going to do it in the show, but we'll maybe do it uh, later this week, which is about the energy crisis that's unfolding. I mean, it's getting desperate in Europe, um, preparing for really, really dark times as it, uh, for, you know, uh, for, for Western energy right now. So again, and people asking like, well, what are we supporting then? We saw the protests. We played them here last week uh, in Germany. Uh, on why are we why are we paying more why why we're not allowed to keep the lights on or keep our heaters on we're being told so that we can support this and for what and at the end of the day so that we can support this proxy war where these weapons are being sold on, on the black market um, I spoke to I spoke to a, a, a pilot today who told me that the drug runs that come the 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 arms runs that are coming out of Ukraine they need pilots they're running they're running arms out of there like crazy and selling them on the black market. So that's where your tax dollars are going. They're going right into Ukraine and right back out again on the black market. Um, so I think Germans are probably sitting there wondering the same thing. All well, right. I would really like to know who's getting those arms, by the way. You know, who's going to be using those against us next? Yes. A, yeah, we all remember question. the 80s, right? And, <laughs> in, in, uh, you know, in Afghanistan. So yeah, the again, Mujahideen and yeah. Yep. Yeah. They all come back to you. Uh, we've got a lot more news to get to here on the show. Um, Kim Iverson is our guest at the Kim Iverson Show. She's here with us for the hour or so, depending on uh, how long we go. Um, we're going to be talking about her leaving uh, the rising um, and uh, going independent. So we're going to be talking with her about that. We've got more news. We're going to be talking about vaccine microchips and the latest on the Trump fallout. Big news from Team Trump uh, we're going to get to in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Indeed. Your business is your dream. You want the people who share it with you, you know, to have the skills to help it grow. Find them faster with Indeed. We're big fans of this company because... Uh, I, you know, my mom, in fact, hires a lot of people at her at her nonprofit and they use Indeed all of the time. It allows them to attract, interview and hire candidates all in one place instead of spending hours or multiple job, uh, multiple job sites trying to search for candidates with the right skills. Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Find great talent faster through time-saving tools like their Instant Match, their assessments, their virtual interviews. With Instant Match, over 80% of employees get high-quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed Data United States. One of the things you, you, know, you love about Indeed is that it makes the hiring process easy all in one place. So you're not having to hunt and peck and go to all sorts of different site, sites and different areas to find the right candidate. They help star applicants shine with over 135 assessment tests from cooking to coding. So it doesn't matter who you're trying to hire, they're going to have these different assessment tests to help you find the right person. So here's what I want you to do. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job posting at indeed.com slash redacted. 
Offer is good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now by going to indeed.com slash redacted. Again, that's indeed.com slash redacted. Terms and conditions apply. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. So our thanks to them for sponsoring the show and being a big partner here. Um, I should remind all of you before we move on, smash that like button. And we do have a daily newsletter that we publish. And I want you to all to subscribe. Again, it's totally free. Won't cost you anything. And hopefully it'll make you a little smarter in the morning while you're having your cup of coffee. Go to redacted.inc. That's our website. Uh, and sign up. You'll get an email from me, a little welcome email. So you can so you can send me an email back and say hello. And I'll, I, I read them all. It's Clayton at redacted.inc is my email. Um, so you get that little welcome email. Make sure you set me as a VIP because, you know, why not, right? And that way it won't go to spam. So set me as a VIP, okay? And then... All yeah. right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you okay? Yeah. All right. Okay, if I talk now, I'm going to... Yeah, go ahead, please. Story. You drink some water. All right. I'll Pipe down water. over there. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Well, former President Trump was all set to testify to the New York State Attorney General today, but he instead used his right to the Fifth Amendment to avoid testifying. Now, the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution establishes a number of rights related to legal proceedings, including the one that no one shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Now, this is not a criminal case. This is separate from the raid, so let's put that aside for a second because this is a civil fraud case, but it has come to, the Fifth Amendment does apply to cases like this too now. Um, now, the, it is likely that the raid did throw a wrench in the wheel of this Attorney General case. The Attorney General case is investigating whether the Trumps inflated the values of properties to get loans. The Attorney General's office has fought hard to force Trump and his three children, Don Jr., Eric, and Ivanka, to testify, and a judge then ordered them to, con to comply. They were actually scheduled to do this in mid-July, but you may recall Ivana Trump died unexpectedly, and so the deposition was moved. Um, it did seem at the time that all three were willing to go through with the deposition, but then again, like I said, this unexpected death, right? Eric Trump was deposed in 2020, and he pleaded the Fifth Amendment over 500 times in that deposition, according to court filings. Ivanka and Don Jr.'s depositions also went ahead as scheduled, but we don't know if or how many times they pleaded the fifth because you can use it on a question by question basis. That's not what President Trump did. He pleaded it entirely, meaning no part of the deposition took place. Uh, the former president may very well have been prepared to do this deposition if not for the raid on his home by the FBI, which would spook anybody, of course, right? So the former president released a statement on his Truth Social. He said, I once asked, if you're innocent, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? Now I know the answer to that question. The United States Constitution exists for this purpose and I will utilize it to the fullest extent to defend myself against this malicious attack. Now this, I just wanna stop for a second before we continue. Um, also, can you clean my glasses to have this? Because I can't see what That's I'm what reading. That's what I do. She's, uh, I buy these microfiber like, cloths and she doesn't know how to use them. All I see is my own fingerprint from she putting it on. She literally has a wool blanket that she's sitting with. That will not clean glasses. No, it will just, but you have those microfibers over there. Yes, I will clean it. Uh, one thing that struck me about this is that it is a little bit contrite. And that is not something we're used to out of President Trump. He never, when he's asked about things he said in the past, like, but you said this, or you said you wouldn't do this. He usually deflects or gets grumpy, but he's actually addressing something that he has said before. And that surprised me. Did, that, did the tone hit you in any which way, Kim? I mean, I, I, in listening to the statement, you know, reading the whole thing, um, you know, I, it didn't really strike me. It just, it made me understand really his thinking. And I think he is scared. I mean, it kind of almost came across that way. Like he's yes. genuinely feeling now the power of this sort of um, what I think many of us look at and, and say, this does look like a political witch hunt. I mean, they keep going after yeah. him 
over and over and over again. And so he's not getting any relief at all. I mean, impeachment one, impeachment two, this civil case, which is about his uh, properties, they, they claim that he inflated the value of his properties, right, in order to get mm-hmm. bigger loans or something. Right. And then, of course, the raid. I mean, I just think he's starting to feel like, wow, they're really just going to, it's never going to end. And so maybe there's fear there. But yeah, yeah you're mean, right. He's normally like pretty bombastic. It seems, I guess, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I th- he, I, I don't, I've never seen him act like this. Um, and but he, and he was not afraid, of course, to to talk about the Fifth Amendment many, many times. Now, this is how, yeah. if you if you saw today, because we like to be show you every side of the story here on this show. And today there was a number of liberal uh, like TikTok accounts and, and Twitter accounts that, of course, were in heaven flipping out and super happy about this. Right. Michael Rappaport, the uh, actor, the actor, you know, who hates Trump. He tweeted out this compilation. Sorry that it's a little squished. It's a TikTok video, so it looks a little squishy here. Um, but anyway, you get the point where he talked about the Fifth Amendment multiple times. Take a listen. If you're innocent, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? When you have your staff taking the Fifth Amendment, taking the Fifth so they're not prosecuted, when you have the man that set up the illegal server taking the Fifth, I think it's disgraceful. Have you seen what's going on in front of Congress? Fifth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Fifth Amendment. Horrible. Horrible. Now, I find this to be a little bit ignorant because if you are facing a criminal investigation, which it does now seem that the president is based on this FBI raid on his house, his lawyers would absolutely want to avoid a deposition because a deposition would be usable in the federal case and he could absolutely implicate himself. So no matter what you think of President Trump, no lawyer after a federal federal raid would say, oh, okay, well now tomorrow's the deposition on another case, you know, you're rested up for that. Do you have your lunch packed? Absolutely, that's that it just wouldn't happen, period. Right. And Kim, with your legal background, were you a lawyer or I, you I don't have a no, I just happen to be married to one. But. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so you know a lot about the law. But that's actually is that the case? I mean on the deposition side, like you give a deposition over here. They're, it's now they yeah. can use it anywhere they want, right? That's actually a really good question. I could just uh, I, I could ask my lawyer here in the <laughs> chat. <laughs> um, I'm fairly but, uh, certain yeah. that it would be usable, uh, and it, it, especially and and that any government agency could at least apply to have those things. Like well, there's were, a strong there's a strong chance that he would implicate himself. Well, I just in want, anything really. And, and I just wanted to say, Kim, because I know there's a lot of ignorance when people just jump on social media about the legal process, right? I mean, this was something you addressed recently with the Alex Jones uh, trial, right? And so there's a lot of ignorance. People just jump on things and think think one way, but they don't understand the intricacies of how a particular trial might play out or how uh, you know a default judgment might play out or how a deposition might play out, right? Right. Yeah, my husband, by the way, just said, yes. You, I asked him, can a deposition in one case be used against you in another case? He says, yes, I do it all the time. He uh-huh. says if someone is claiming something, you know, uh, basically then, yeah, so he kind of gives me an example. But yeah, he says you can take anything they say in court, I, I suppose, and use it against them. So then, I mean, deposition. no matter how anyone wants to dunk on this on Twitter, oh, you're taking the fifth, you said you'd never do it. This is an extreme case in which pretty much every lawyer representing Donald Trump in this instance would say, you must take the fifth. No matter, even if he was willing to do this, which makes me wonder if uh, Attorney General Letitia Jones is furious because she was just 24 hours, 48 hours away from deposing the president when the FBI got into his house and spooked him off. She very well could have otherwise got her deposition. She may be fuming and saying, couldn't you guys wait 48 hours, 72 hours? Well, that's a great question. So we were kind of chatting about it before the show, and let's open it up to our audience too. And let's ask everyone in the chat. This is a really interesting point, right? If you're if you're Letitia Jones, you're the attorney general, you know you're meeting with the president this week in this deposition. You're gonna be talking with him finally. Do you think that she's pissed? Do you first of all, do you think that Trump would have actually talked and not pleaded the fifth had the FBI not raided his house? Like would he would have gone in there and actually talked? 
Like, did this throw a wrench in the works? Uh, I'm just curious what people think about that. Kim, what do you think? Do you think that he would have talked if not for this Mar-a-Lago raid? Yeah, I think so. I think wow. uh, he's not shy for work. I think he would have said, so. yeah, I think he, because this was a civil case about, you know, as we mentioned, fraudulent, supposedly or allegedly fraudulently inflating the value of his properties. And so I think he would have maybe said something about that. Um, but yeah, when you're facing a criminal case and the U.S. government is coming after you, I don't think anybody should be saying anything. If the government's coming after you, you probably, no matter who you are, whether you be the former president of the United States or just me, you know, you probably are better off pleading the fifth. I mean, they're going to use everything they can to get you. And I think it's really obvious to him now, especially with this raid on Mar-a-Lago and they're claiming that it's for um, the presidential, uh, what is it? What's the act? The Records name of the Act, act again? The, the, of yeah. 1978, you know, yeah. Right. So they're claiming that he may, you know, he, which the president has the right at any time to declassify anything the president wants. There is a process you have to go through in order to do that. So this is a, a, a maybe a criminal case about procedure. So saying, well, you didn't properly declassify these documents. Um, you know that so it does it, it it's it, then it you know it, unless there's more to it than that it once again reeks of political witch hunting just something that others have done and it gets overlooked and then when he does it it doesn't get overlooked so when he sees now that they're just going to come after him and come after him for anything uh and you know i have no doubt that he's done some things wrong i have no doubt that any of these wealthy people uh, who, who've been, you know, I mean, Trump's been in business forever and ever and ever. He's been doing things for a really long time and they're just now going after him, you know, when he's no longer in their political favor. It, I mean, they had years to go after him when he was just a rich person in Manhattan conducting business. They could have done it at any time. Yes. So it smells of this. And I think he knows that. And so it is in his best interest to just not say a word, which is very unlike him, right? He likes to talk. Right. But I yes. think maybe if it hadn't been for this. <clears throat> I'm sure but he's got he, a whole... he is saying words through his campaign now, or what looks like a campaign, because in uh, overnight after the raid, um, after the news of the raid was Tuesday, that this whole week is just like Monday's the raid, Tuesday's the news, Wednesday's the day. <laughs> like that's right. my whole week, right? <laughs> um, Tuesday night he launched what looks to be a campaign ad. We're gonna play you just the few, first few seconds of it. Um, I think it does strike the tone of like. Now this is serious, you guys, and, you know, he's kind of ready to speak for himself. Listen. Yeah. We are a nation in decline. We are a failing nation. Let me... Yeah, no, this is, this is the ad. Like, you can keep playing it. It's just rain, like... This no. is it. We yeah, are this a is nation it. Nation that has the highest inflation in over 40 years. It. Where the stock market just finished the worst first half of a year in more than It's like a thunderstorm. Wow. He says this We're is a nation, nation in decline. That has the highest energy cost in its history. And we are no longer energy independent or energy dominant, which we were just two short years ago. And it just goes on. But as a result of that, by the way, he had the most campaign contributions or he a record overnight with the number of campaign contributions after this raid on Mar-a-Lago. So if you're because his supporters are furious, they're pissed because he they he sort of has primed them for this. Right. Telling him they are coming after me in a very personal way because of my connection to you, the American people. Um, you know, some political pundits are even saying like this is almost too good to be true for him because it plays exactly into his narrative. And if he had any waning base before, he definitely won't. Now, we spoke about yesterday how, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much the GOP is united in their defense against him now. Um, the GOP, which, you know, kind of sighed collectively when he left office because they were put in so many corners about supporting him on some things and not others. Uh, Mitch McConnell was not one of them. He seemed to always come for Donald Trump whenever Donald Trump called him, uh, like a Th Theon Greyjoy. And, uh, but he now has come out and said, the country deserves a thorough and immediate explanation of what led to the events on Monday. 
Um, he said Attorney General Garland and the Department of Justice should have already provided answers to the American people and must do so immediately. And I agree with him uh, for how divisive and how emotional this is for so many people. Um, it would be nice to have some kind of explanation of why this is. Otherwise, the conclusion continues to be drawn, which hunt, which hunt, right? Yeah, yeah. and so... And I'd love to get Kim's thoughts on these. By the way, Kim Iverson joining us from the Kim Iverson Show. Um, not a lawyer, but married to a lawyer. Um, I thought <laughs> I thought because she she speaks uh, so highly, uh, she such intelligence on legal issues on your show. I thought, wow, she must be a legal background here. Um, <laughs> no. But I want to get the um, so some raid updates here because if we're waiting on the government to tell us, like we're waiting on the government to give us like updates on what, what happened, what are they looking for, what is the, what is the cause of this. Um, Mitch McConnell's absolutely right. So we have some updates now. We're learning more details about the raid on from on Florida. Um, we're learning that uh, the FBI searched Melania Trump's wardrobe, spent a long time going through her clothing. I mean, I would too, though. She's you got would a lot see. of fabulous things. <laughs> <So> <laughs> like, I'd wow. be right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no matter what you think of them, I was always just so fascinated by her, by her wardrobe. Yeah, she looks she looks great all the time. So yeah, well, maybe I they were looking touch for some of those bags. Maybe they were looking for stuff yeah. hidden in the bags or behind clothing or whatever. They went through every room. They, I mean, it's a sprawling estate. Um, uh, the post, the, the New York Post learned that the search warrant, uh, the search warrant issued by the FBI to enter the, the focus solely on the presidential records and the evidence of classified information being stored there. So, okay, then you're going through her clothing. Okay, that's interesting. A source also was concerned that the FBI and DOJ lawyers conducting the search could have planted stuff. Okay, this is a big story that's been unfolding today is that Donald Trump is, they're worried that the FBI or that the DOJ in the House maybe planted stuff. Um, the New York Times is saying that this is baseless. This is the New York Times headline on this. They said this is totally baseless. Um, Trump is baselessly suggesting the FBI might have planted evidence during its search. Um, but of course, conspiracies are going to run rampant because there are reports today that inside the house, they were at the agents asked the, um, the groundskeepers or whomever to turn off the security cameras while they conducted their raid. So we know you have security cameras all over this, all over Trump's house. Please turn them off while we conduct our raid. Hmm. And, and the Trump, the Trump team said, no, we're not going to. So that's interesting. I would think this is conjecture that you would need a warrant for that piece of it too. I don't know. Right. I would think so too. I wouldn't do it. I'd be like, no. In fact, I'm going to whip out my cell phone and start recording you guys while we're at it. I'm going live. <laughs> yeah. Three, two, one. Right. <laughs> exactly. The, of course. We would have to, they would have to have a court order to get you to turn off those cameras. So, so I guess where you could um, see the concern about stuff being planted, right? You could you could make that mental leap then if you're the president and you're, you're hearing that they asked you to turn off all the cameras so they could spend hours in your personal office and do other things. And again, it goes back to that feeling of desperation. It kind of goes back to that Ukraine-Russia conflict of who did what, you know, who done it. And you just have to look at who's more desperate. And we've seen that the establishment and as you point out on both sides not just the democratic establishment but the republican establishment as well they do not want trump back they hate him they don't want him to come back they don't like what he stands for and they're desperate because he's only rising in popularity everything they have done to try to get people to turn on him from the first impeachment second impeachment, to everything yeah. they've tried he's only gained in popularity and his war chest for a can for campaigning has just grown exponentially and so it just goes to show how stupid for, I mean, for one, you know, when, it, when we hear this story and it's, it's like now he's got record donations coming to him. And I think that's not just from his supporters, but probably a lot of independents as well, mm -hmm. who are disgusted by what they saw because Trump, the raid on, on Mar-a-Lago could very well turn out, depending on what, you know, we still are waiting for the information of what exactly they're looking for. But if it really does just boil down to, well, he, we think he took classified information without going through the process of declassifying it properly or somebody on his team didn't properly go through that process or whatever if it comes down to technicalities you know this is going to be viewed on the republican side as like their january 6th the u.s president the former yeah. u.s president was raided his house was raided that is that's like the stuff you hear about going on in brazil 
not here in the United States. That's banana republic level stuff. So this yeah. will, people are looking at this in shock and horror, thinking yeah, it's you're one, going to really go after political opponents like this. I think you're absolutely right about that. It was one thing for, you know, uh, Democrats to use the IRS. What was it, the Cincinnati office to go after Republican political uh, opponents, right? They used the IRS office out of Cincinnati. I believe it was Southern Ohio, right? And there was a whole backlash about that. But that was small compared to this, like using, weaponizing yeah. the Department of Justice to go after your political opponents at the presidential level. I mean, because who else do they have to run against them right now, right? Like, and from a third party candidates, um, this is this is your guy. If you're if you're sort of in the middle, you're independent. I think you bring up a great point. You might say, well, I don't see anybody else coming forward that I'm going to support against this. What's what's happening right now in the United States? This is not the country that I support anymore. Yeah. Um, and here's somebody that's saying they're going to completely drain the swamp, um, and they're seeing what's happening to them. Uh, I think you're absolutely right about that. And when, you know, a thought that goes through my mind constantly is, you know, when my ballot comes, uh, when it's time to make the vote, um, at this point, if it were Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, my thought is Trump would have withdrawn by with from NATO by now. This war wouldn't be quite so bloody. It wouldn't be so drawn out. Um, you know, am I then, if, if I voted for Trump, would I be voting for this war to end earlier? And that would weigh heavily in, on my decision. But then you have to think about the deep state and how massive the military industrial complex is. Sure. You know, um, they talked him out, of course, you know, the, the actual withdrawal of Afghanistan in the way that he wanted to and other stuff. So, I mean, the, yeah. de the deep state is strong. You know, the military yeah. entrenched industrial complex that, may, you know, they they know you're there for four years and you're gone. And But that, but. that you know, that deep state stays. But look at it this way now, you know, Trump now knows that. I mean, the first term, uh, he claimed it getting into office. I think he somewhat believed it. Maybe it was more the team around him kind of telling him, hey, listen, you know, you've got to dismantle all of the corruption, drain the swamp, all of that that's going on there. And what we saw was he got in there. He was like green to the whole process and made a lot of bad decisions of people that he allowed to surround him. A lot of these establishment folks that, you know, ended up being moles and leaking stuff to the press and ended up trying to undermine his decisions. And um, and then he had to battle them. And I think he realized, especially on his way out, that, you know, when you've got guys like Mitch McConnell completely throwing, you know, just being like, oh, OK, now we're fully separating from this guy. We don't like him, hoping to to separate him from the Republican base unsuccessfully. Um, I think now if Trump were to go in for a second term, I, you know, it's it's it could go one of two ways. Right. Like he either now learned the establishment is strong and you really do need to go in there and drain the swamp. You got to figure it out, but do what you can to dismantle it. Or he could become like a, at the, then he would become the worst nightmare that people that were afraid of him were crying out for saying the guy's going to be this crazy dictator. I mean, it could, you know, he could right. just use it and say, that's it. Like, I'm just going scorched earth on this place. I mean, I would love dictating. to think, I would love to see that that happen because, you know, the first time he didn't drain the swamp, right? That's a huge right. criticism. I'm going to drain the swamp. I'm going to drain the swamp. And he didn't. I mean, you, you know, you might be a huge Trump supporter and you might think that he did. He did not. Like the facts are in on that. He did not do that. So would he do right. it this time? I think you're right. Like he had a lot of yes men around him telling him, look, Donald, you need to like curry favor with the Washington elite. You need to, you need to, you know, do this things right, you know, do things right. And maybe you're right. This time, if he got in, he would actually say, nope, I'm done. I've learned my lesson. All of you guys are fired. I mean, yeah, might be an empty and that's Washington, D.C. do it. That's what he'd have to do, because what he learned the first time around is you can't trust any of them. I mean, they sat there and they said, oh, no, I'm here to drain the swamp with you. Hire me. I'm here to do that. You know, yeah, right. in this position. And it didn't happen. Instead, they turned on him and he saw the reality of the establishment of the machine of the deep state or whatever you want to call it. And maybe this time around, he would say and, and this ad kind of gives that tone, right? This ad that he's released, it kind of gives that tone of like, OK, we're serious, as you mentioned. Yeah, let's do this. Right. It's like, look, we're in a dire time. It's time to come out with everything we've got. Um, and, you know, the tone, it, it hits, yeah, <laughs> you it know, hit. it yeah, feels it that way. Yeah. The thunderstorm. And yeah, that's not something, again, I thought that I would ever say. But our guest, our guest is Kim Iverson from the Kim Iverson Show. Our chat room says, oh, so glad to see Kim here. Yes, we are as well. Thrilled to have Kim here. Um, coming up after the, uh, coming up in just a moment, we're going to talk to Kim about her departure from the Rising, uh, what she's doing now as an independent journalist, and sort of the catalyst for having left the Rising. It was sort of a maybe a battle 
behind the scenes about Dr. Fauci and not being able to interview him. We'll talk about that. I think uh, uh, there is no article, right? It's just rising. Is it rising or the rising? It's rising. Rising. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Rising. But first, we're going to tell you about our friends over at HelloFresh. HelloFresh allows you to get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. So you can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. You may have seen a story we did in the newsletter recently about how so much like misdemeanors now are happening in the grocery store. People are going to the grocery store all worked up and emotional. You don't need that. Order your food to be delivered to your house, right? You can save every savor every last second of summer with HelloFresh because they deliver fresh quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week, allowing you to enjoy the delicious flavors of the season right at home. If you're heading out for a last vacation, update your delivery and enjoy HelloFresh at your vacation destination with just a click, or this is a pro tip, allow your HelloFresh to be delivered right when you get back so you don't have to scramble uh, when you come home with an empty refrigerator. That's something that most of us know. Um, so how does HelloFresh save you time? Well, again, it allows you to choose foods that you like. HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than dining in a restaurant and even cheaper than grocery store shopping. That's money back in your pocket. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Redacted16. Use the code Redacted16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash redacted 16. We thank them so much for their support of this show. Yes, and I want to thank all of you for subscribing to our channel here. We're nearing uh, near, nearing a million subscribers, so we're going to have a little million subscriber party um, in which I will eat a cake. Um, I'll drink some scotch. I don't know what I'll do. I, okay. I'm, just, I'm just thinking about things I enjoy. Um, I will read a book. Well, How I about told, this? I I'll do a show. I told you if we get to that point. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I said during I that. Say, I, I told you. I go ahead. <laughs> How about you go and then I'll go? No, I love let the delay. Him go. Yes, go ahead, Philip. Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, I already said that if 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 we get to that million subscriber, when we get to the the one million uh, subscriber, I will do the show nude. All right. Okay. Yeah. And Philip doesn't have a camera on him, so it won't even matter. He he could be nude right now. Um, I'll do the I'll do the show nude, and I'll read a book, and that'll be the most exciting show you've ever seen. I'll just read a book nude. How do you like that idea? I see that all the time. That's right. <laughs> and that's very. That's why she can barely contain herself. Yeah. Um, so yes, please subscribe to the channel and, uh, smash that like button, smash it, not just for us, smash it for Kim Iverson, who's joining us now. All right, let's talk about this. So Kim Iverson is joining us now, um, formerly of rising, not the rising, uh, formerly of rising, um, recently, and we're big fans of her work recently, uh, went independent, uh, left rising over some specific issues that arose. Um, and Kim joins us now to talk about that in independent media and what she's doing now. Kim, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, I'm not with Rising anymore. It is the Rising, not the Rising. I know mm. we had some question about that. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know, two and a half weeks ago now, I think it is, it's been, and we had a breakup. Um, but what really what happened was I, as maybe some of you know, if you watch the show at all, but we had these segments called radars and those are our kind of monologue piece. Uh, and I, we do them every day. And my radars were often centered around the pandemic, COVID-19, Fauci mandates and whatnot. And so I'd spent quite a bit of time um, talking about, you know, really reporting on those issues and being very critical, highly critical of the pandemic. And that was, you know, I brought in millions, literally millions of viewers to rising on those topics. And then I'd found out that Fauci was going to be interviewed by the show. I was one of uh, three hosts or there's a rotating cast of hosts, but I was one of the main hosts that was there every single day. And uh, I got excited thinking, oh, right, here's time. I get to finally confront Fauci with all of his you know, bad decisions throughout the pandemic. And the producers called me the night before the interview was supposed to happen. And they said, you know, we're, we, uh, when we 
when we booked Fauci, his team asked specifically who the hosts would be that would be interviewing him. And we told them Bacha and Robbie. And Robbie Suave is a regular host on the show. He's the, one of the main hosts. And then Bacha Ungar Sargon was a, she's a fill-in host every like Monday or every other Monday or something. And uh, th so they submitted those two names. And then I said, well, that's not acceptable. You're going to have to go back to the Fauci team and tell them that I am going to be in that interview. There's no reason to not have me in there. And the, the audience will revolt if they see that I'm not in that interview. I brought the audience to Rising on this particular topic. And if I'm not in that interview, then they're not, they're not going to be okay with it. And I'm not going to be okay with it. And so they said, okay, you know, we'll, uh, you, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see tomorrow, right? And the next day, that morning, I'm getting ready to do my radar piece and about to pipe in. I, I, I'm in Los Angeles and they're in Washington, D.C., so I always pipe in through Skype. And they called me before I was scheduled to go on and they said, hey, you know, we got to have this difficult conversation. But we decided ultimately not to go back to Fauci's team and to tell them that you would be in on the interview. Um, implying that, you know, the reason why they were afraid, they didn't directly say this, but the reason why they didn't want to approach Fauci's team and say that I'm on it is because apparently Fauci's team had asked them over and over and over again who the hosts were. So hmm. they submitted the names of the hosts, the Fauci team, knowing I was a, the big personality on the show, uh, kept going back and saying, now who are you, you know, and that's it, just those two, like, Nobody mm -hmm. else is going to be popping up, right? Right. And so they knew if they went back, what they've implied is that if they went back, that the Fauci team would cancel the interview. And they ultimately felt like they really needed that interview. And I told them, if you do that, you'll lose the trust of the audience. I have been telling the audience for an entire year since I've been here that, yes, I'm now with corporate media, but they don't censor me. They don't hold me back. They don't, uh, they're not limiting me in any way. And that was true. But now it wouldn't be true. And I wouldn't be able to say that with a straight face and look my audience in the eye and say, don't worry, guys, all is well. Yes, it's corporate media, but they're not holding me back when that's exactly what's happened right here with this Fauci interview. So I yeah. told them I wouldn't be able to stay and, you know, and, and continue to lie to my audience and bring them here and lie to them. I'm not going to do that. And you can't lose the trust of the audience. If you lose the trust of the audience, you're no different than CNN. And then you become CNN plus and you just go by the wayside really fast. <laughs> yeah. Right. All oh, CNN plus it's too soon. I mean, they haven't even, <laughs> they haven't even printed the tombstone for, for CNN plus yet. I'm oh, so sad. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that they felt like they really needed that Fauci interview because every Fauci interview that anyone gets, even CNN is the same stuff, right? So no one's yeah. getting groundbreaking things out of Fauci. But then again, there's no one asking him uncomfortable questions when he goes on CNN or MSNBC. Right. He's happy to talk to those people who ask him exactly that, like, do you still like vaccine mandates? Dr. Fauci, what do you think of the case numbers? Right? Nothing. What about masks? Right? It, yeah. Mask mandates, yeah. that kind of thing. So no one's challenging him, but no one's getting any. So it's interesting. They felt like they needed to have someone who wouldn't challenge him and they needed right. him. And I feel like the world needs more of none of that. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, they, they kind of touted it as this big exclusive interview and that's how they put it out there when they published it. Um, and, and yeah, it's, there's no exclusive with Fauci. I mean, he's, he's all over the place. We see right. him being interviewed all the time and he says the same things. You know what you're going to get out of that guy. So I felt, and what I, the case I made to the producers was it's better for you to go to the Fauci team, have them back out because I'm in it. And then we go to the audience and we say, look, here's a, a government worker paid by our tax dollars, unwilling to face the American people. That right. should be a problem for every American that these government workers won't come face us and answer our questions. And yeah. that is what we go back to the with. We don't go and just do the interview without me. And, you know, of course, what happened was they published the interview. I said nothing to the audience. I was radio silent on what had happened. Everyone in the audience just saw I wasn't in that interview. And now normally on Rising, because I wasn't on every episode, I wasn't on every segment anyway. I joined in halfway through the show and I was only on three out of eight of the segments daily. Normally, when they don't see me, they say, where's Cam? Where's Cam? You see that in the comments all the time. But this time on this interview, they did exactly what I knew they would do without me even saying anything like I've been left out of this interview or anything. They all said, wow, they knew I was left out of that interview. They knew I wouldn't have missed that, that interview. They were 
not just saying, where's Kim? They were saying, how dare you to the Hill? That's what they were saying. How dare you do this to us? And they were livid. And then they didn't ever see me again, unfortunately, on Rising because of it. So, yeah, I mean, their loss and our gain, because now we get more <laughs> Kim and independent media Kim. Um, so, the, you know, you've had the roots in this. So what was that moment like when you when you decided to say, you know, give them the middle finger and say, OK, bye, guys, I've got to. And, and the, the good thing is you get to walk out that door with your integrity. I see so many people here in our chat saying good for you. That's how they became a fan of you when you did that. Right. So you got to walk out that door with your integrity. Uh, what was that moment like for you? I mean, it's like a, it's, it's sad. I'm still sad. You know, I'm sad about it. It, it was a good relationship. It was like one of, I felt, I feel cheated on. Like I was blindsided. I had this wonderful relationship. Like I was married and it was all going great. And I thought, I thought everything was rosy. And, and then they were making promises to me. Like we were about to launch my own show on the Hill. So I was leaving rising and going and doing my own show with the company. And we were, we had finished the negotiation on that. Everything was done except for signing the paper, which is actually going to happen like the next day. Um, and so I just feel like suddenly I got a packet in the mail and saw my husband cheating on me. You know, yeah. it just was devast. It was sad. It wasn't, but I had no choice but to say, okay, this is unfortunately over now. I mean, I can't stay like this. This is, I've made promises to myself, to the audience. I, I vouched for you, you know, and that was the thing right. is I vouched for them yeah. for a year. I vouched for him because previously, you know, Crystal and Sagar had left and when they left, they did some media tours and they were talking about being limited or censored or something. And um, and so then I when I joined the Hill, I said, hey, you know, I'll come here, but I can't be limited or censored. And the minute that happens, I can't be here. And they didn't they didn't limit me or censor me. They didn't even know what my radar topics were until the morning I did them. And I would just no. be like, here's what I'm talking about, guys. Yeah. So they didn't have they never asked, like, what are you talking about? They, ne they just let me do my radars completely on my own with no controls on those whatsoever. And so I vouched for them for a year. And then that happened. And it was like the one time this was the biggest interview on the topic of COVID. That was the topic that I brought all these viewers to see rising over. And they're going to exclude me from the biggest interview on that particular topic. You know, that a career making potentially interview if I would have been able to actually grill the guy. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. that. so yeah, it just felt sad more than anything. I'm still sad. Everybody that worked there was really great. I really loved everybody I worked with. I really enjoyed it. I was, I was happy. And, uh, but they put me in a position where I felt like there was no other choice. Unfortunately, I, I, I didn't really feel like I had the choice. I felt they gave me no choice. Yeah. I you can't know, see so another choice. I can't see another option. There was here. no other choice. Right. Yes, but um, I too worked for mainstream media and had a heartbreaking breakup in the same way. And I know how that hits because you give it your all, you believe in it, right? You see it happening to other people around you and you think, no, no, I've got a good relationship. It's okay, right? And then when it comes your way, you're like, oh, how did, but I was so loyal. How did that happen? And it takes a long time to mourn it. Um, and I remember when I walked out of that position and I was crying um, and I remember thinking like, okay, I'm on my own now. So there's gonna be high highs and there's gonna be low lows. There's gonna be the phone rings and then there's gonna be no phone ringing, right? And you just have to believe in yourself enough to bank on yourself that like you've made the right decision and you're going the right path and that takes bravery. Um, so from one, you know, sort of like, ex-media wife to another <laughs> i applaud you <laughs> i know what that's like it's really tough well now in yeah. in 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 your well in her defense well now you didn't have the media then coming after you in the way that they've come after her right away so like here's right. the daily here's the daily beast right when, upon your leaving and i loved your your take on this on your instagram you said so here was there the daily beast conspiracy theorist host sparks revolt at dc insider rag and so um, you know, you leave, they, they're saying, well, the conspiracy theorist leaves. Right. And I want to say we welcome, like to me, like if you're a conspiracy theorist, we love to have you here on the show because that's a badge of honor because conspiracy theories right. are simply six month spoiler alerts, you know? Um, right. so were you surprised by some, some of the mainstream media jumping on you about this or just coming after you in the past? 
no, I mean, whatever. I, you know, I, it's, it's like, for one, the Daily Beast to me is like a tabloid, you know, for politics, for political talk. I mean, it's just, it's, right. I don't even, it's, it's not a serious news organization by any means. I mean, maybe it was at one point, but it is, I just don't think it is anymore. So I wasn't really that surprised by it. But, you know, I might be naive, you know, I might be naive to what, level of damage that actually does to my reputation so to me i think oh whatever i'm like you it's a badge of honor right um you call me conspiracy theorist you've called a lot of really great journalists conspiracy theorists so what do i care right. but maybe it is actually more harmful than i think it is you know to the average person that reads daily beast or but do average people read daily beast you know i don't know i think they're just yeah, hyper political that's a, really, that's a really good answer i mean i i you know it is true i mean when you get these kind of attacks leveled at you by by this corporate media, Chelsea Clinton run corporate media. I think Chelsea Clinton sits on the board of the Daily Beast. I don't yeah. know any. I don't know anyone that reads it. I'm sure it pops up in people's news feeds. Let me ask our audience: How many of you read the Daily Beast? Um, I don't know if you do, <laughs> um, but um, but I there's know. nothing outstanding in your media because I I, I did read the article. I'm I'm sorry to give but, it. And a this click. is from April. We should point out. Yeah. This um, is yeah. There was one from April, and then there was one right when I left that they then yeah. published yes. right after. Yeah, um, you know, saying y you are very critical about the 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 pandemic and vaccine mandates, and but it's there's no outrageous sort of Alex Jones type piece like she is saying this that they can level against you. It's sort of the overall tone, right? So you are a bit slippy, slipperier, slipper slippery more slippery <laughs> than say alex jones or um who's a podcaster that we all hate the um that joe all, rogan we right hate? we don't hate him oh. but the the mainstream media hates <laughs> the him media, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i don't hate joe rogan um you know th they're easier and it seems like uh, my take on this was like they would love to get a hook in you like that because it it, it would be another notch in the like see anti-covid people are nuts um right but they they're but not they able get, but well, because when they labeled me a conspiracy theorist from the beginning, it was because I said the vaccines don't stop the spread. Yeah. And so that's what they were claiming was my big conspiracy. Well, right. I mean, <laughs> hello. It's yeah. hard to, yeah, right. Like at this point, if you still believe they, they stop the spread, then you're the conspiracy theorist, actually. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, so um, that is really when they began labeling me was over that one thing, because that was the contention that Ryan Grimm and I had on Rising, the battle we had over and over and over again, was I just kept asserting it doesn't stop the spread. So, and he kept battling me on that point, like, well, it, it drastically, you know, he would go from, yes, it does, to it drastically reduces it to, well, if you get a booster, you know, uh, then it kind of morphed, right? The, the argument on that other side morphed from yes, it does to well, it, it mostly does to it kind of does to well, at least you won't die if you get the vaccine like that it <laughs> right. will kill you. And so that battle played out over months where I just kept asserting it doesn't stop the spread. And that made me the conspiracy theorist when I was the one actually listening to the science. Legitimately, I was actually watching the FDA meetings that were like eight hours long. I'd watch the entire meeting and I would see the scientists and the doctors get up there and say, you know, especially the data coming out of Israel, the Israelis were showing up to these meetings and they were saying it doesn't stop the spread. You know, we're, we're trying it out in our own country. It's not working. We're going to have to give another dose of this and hope that does it. So but I got labeled and uh, then they label me for other, you know, other opinions of mine that they don't agree with uh, when it comes to maybe Russia, Ukraine or China and the Uyghurs or something like that. And so then they just say conspiracy theorists, even or though free speech. Yeah, right. Right. Which right. Is, anything, anything. Yeah. Um, you know, free speech is something we talk about a lot here and we all have to sort of dance this YouTube dance. And, um, you know, your channel has been uh, penalized. You've had some strikes for certain things. I can't remember now exactly what they were, but, um, you know, how is it that I guess we can sort of commiserate on how hard it is to be able to say things? Like I said, sometimes I, I see you say something and I'm like, OK, she, she said that. We can say something sort of like that because <laughs> yeah. this video is here. I right. saw it. Right. And so we have yeah. to sort of help each other out on how to say things while being mm -hmm. on this uh, platform that is decreasing, uh, decreasingly about free well, speech. And I just want to say, yeah. like, we all sort of dance around it sometimes. And then like CNN finally does a video, right, where you have like, oh, my God, well, there you go. Sanjay Gupta just said it. Right. Does that mean now we can all say it? 
And you see this distrust in the mainstream media. We played the numbers here about two weeks ago on the show about the declining you know, faith that Americans and the world have in their media. Um, that's probably why. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, if something is said on CNN, it still does not give you license to say it on YouTube. They have their own very strict rules. They still have in place. There are certain things you cannot say on YouTube, um, but there are certainly are many things you can say. So you, you know, like I would recommend, by the way, at the bottom of this, in the description of this video in particular, go in and put a CDC disclaimer in it real quick saying the CDC says, you know, according to the CDC, the vaccine is safe and effective and everybody should get on their vaccine, the recommended vaccine schedule, including their boosters and whatnot. Like, <laughs> Just stick the, the disclaimer in the description. But I mean, look, there are many things you can say. Um, you don't have to dance around them. And then there are things for sure that you're and, there, and the things that you can't say are still very it's weird. You know, they have yeah. these weird rules and they don't yeah. make any sense. It's like, so I'm allowed to say this. That sounds more outrageous, but I can't say this because it's in the guidelines. Yeah. So it's like you can't you have to avoid the mask discussion. You have to avoid any election discussion. You have to avoid like there's certain discussions. But uh, we sad. learned the hard way even at the Hill because we got removed or at least um, banned from uploading for a week. And I've had it happen on my own channel. So you kind of learn the hard yeah, way. Yeah, that's happened to us. Yeah. Well, we've got more news to get to here. We're glad that Kim is joining us. I want to do one more story with y'all before we uh, before we head out. And uh, oh, before we get to that, though, David, our producer wants to know, can you tell us one question you had planned yes. to ask Dr. Fauci that you were not you my, able to? You read my wow. mind because I was going to say if you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, David, thank you for that great question, because I was going to say you had all these questions ready to go for Dr. Fauci. What would you now bearing in mind that we're on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> what would you have what would you have asked the guy? I would have asked him, I think what I feel is still very consequential in people's lives right now, and it's about the mandates. So what is a vaccine to him? And why are we still then mandating this vaccine that we know is not stopping the spread? Um, and so we've got, you know, you can't enter the United States right now if you are an unvaccinated non-citizen. So if you're European, you cannot travel into the United States unvaccinated, even though Americans can go to Europe. So why is there that discrepancy? Or why are we still encouraging universities, for example, to mandate the vaccine for young, for young adults that are 19, 20, 21 years old? Why are preschoolers being mandated to take this when we know that they're at very low risk of severe disease and the vaccine does not stop the spread? So knowing that, you know, why is there not a, a now the new message being take the vaccine if you're in a very vulnerable category and, you know, you like make it a personal decision. Why are we not going down that path? So that's to me, I think the biggest thing I would have wanted to ask him is really pressing him on this, the current existing mandates that are still there and even the possibility of future mandates. So that would have been my big, I mean, I would have had limited time with him because there was three of us, but. You know what would have been great? What 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 would be even better is that you get him on your on your show now. That yeah. Would, <laughs> let's all push for that. Let's all push for that. Right. So you, you don't have to be get under the guys, me. yeah, the corporate media. Let's have that happen. Yes, Dr. Fauci. I would love to have a discussion with him and to really lay out all this stuff. Like, wh you know, where what is his reasoning now? And he he just right now his answer is like, well, that wasn't my recommendation. That's the CDC, or that wasn't. Uh, all I do is I just give science, and then these universities mandate when they want to mandate. That's not me. It's like, well, you could give the recommendation for them not to mandate. Yeah. Right. I mean, that could be a recommendation coming from Fauci. Right. Well, and he also said he is science. So it's a little hard for to, to, se <laughs> to separate himself from science when he admitted that he is science. So mm -hmm. good question. Good question. I wish we would have gotten you to see you ask those questions, but hopefully on your own show, we'll be able to do that. Um, we'll have links below to Kim's show in our description. Make sure you check that out. Um, and her most recent show about uh, vaccine and animal testing is worth checking out. That that was fabulous. Yes, fact checking the fact checkers. Good good stuff on that. Um, so please check that out. Um, all right, we've got more news to get to. Um, we're going to talk about microchips with vaccine data. Yes, this is a thing. And would you? All, we're going to ask you right now in the chat room. Would you allow your government to stick a microchip into your hand? Okay, like the size of a piece of rice. 
that would have all sort of critical health data on it, including your credit cards, in addition to your health data, be able to go through transit lines like at the subway just to scan yourself in, pay for your dinners with your arm, go up to a vending machine. Yes, people are opting to do this, and we will talk more about it in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Gold Co. If you have an IRA, a 401k or a savings account, things are scary out there. The Biden administration has already printed more money in the past two years than the previous 100 years combined. The national debt hit a record $30 trillion and inflation is the highest we've seen since 1982. It's only a matter of time before the house of cards comes crashing down. If you have retirement savings, your money could be at serious risk. And so, uh, you know, I've been beating this drum for many, many years. We buy real assets, assets that are that are actual physical things, okay? The performing assets, not fake government currency and fiat, fiat money. Remember, every government currency in world history has collapsed. What makes you think the ones that you have your retirement account won't collapse? Do you remember Greece a number of years ago when you tried to go to the ATM to get your money out and the bank said, sorry, we don't have any of your money? Yeah, this actually happens. It happens more often than you think it does. And so you need to have your money in precious metals, in real estate, in things that are tangible and real and that perform and protect your family. Um, so go to Gold Co. and check out our friends over there. You can go to redactedlikesgold.com. If you go to redactedlikesgold.com, they're going to give you $10,000 in free silver when you open a qualifying account. So we've had a lot of people who wrote to me and said they opened an account. Thank you for letting them know. You can go get your free gold report right now by going to redactedlikesgold.com. That's the website you need to go to to get your gold report and get $10,000 in free silver when you open a qualifying account. Again, redactedlikesgold.com. Kim Iverson is joining us for the hour, which has turned into an hour and a half. Well, I that's told okay. you. But I know, but she planned for two hours, and now I'm taking advantage of the fact that she said two hours, but All I'm, right. I'm not going to do that. Well, no. we're going to keep you for one more story because you love vaccines so much, and we're going to talk about yeah. this idea yeah. of <laughs> vaccine microchips. So vaccine microchips, I want to ask, I'll ask all of you right now, let me ask you a question. If the government told you that you needed to get a microchip, not even if it was your choice, you needed to get a microchip implant with all of your health data on it, um, including vaccine information, vaccine passport information, would you do it or what would you do? Would you revolt? Would you say absolutely not? We've got so many people here in the chat weighing in on it. I think overwhelmingly the answer is no. This might sound like a conspiracy theory, but it's actually happening. Uh, as far back as 2018, NPR had a report that said the microchips are about the size of a single grain of rice and, and were becoming so popular at the time that one of the main companies producing these microchips um, producing them reported difficulty keeping up with demand because people wanted them so much. Uh, they also covered a Bloomberg report about how these uh, they, these used the same backdoor technology that was being used by the CIA and the Pentagon. Take a listen to this NPR report. Bloomberg has a big story out today about a tiny microchip, not much bigger than a grain of rice. The chip has been found in the type of computer servers used by at least 30 major American companies, including Apple and major banks. Also, servers used by the Pentagon and the CIA. The Pentagon and the CIA. Sorry, I cut off there at the end. The Pentagon and the CIA. Um, in fact, Swedish workers were accepting this pre-COVID in 2017, Swedish workers in Sweden were saying, hey, yeah, we'll go for this because this will make our lives easier. We'll be able to take the subway, be able to ride transit, be able to pay, pay for vending machines and all of this stuff. In 2017, a railway company in Sweden began allowing travelers to load their ticket information onto the microchip that was implanted into their bodies. And according to the BBC, railway conductors were then able to use smart uh, smartphones to detect the chip and confirm the traveler's tickets. And Swedish people went nuts for them and started injecting themselves so they could hop on rail cars faster. And they had a run on these chips and they needed more of them. Now, stop me if you know where this is going. Like railway, you know, paying for transit tickets, that's one thing. But stop me if you know where this is going. Let's take a look at Newsweek. Here's their Newsweek's cover story. People get microchips implanted that include vaccine records amid new COVID restrictions. Now, at the time we did this story at the turn of the year, when people were saying, yeah, we want to have easier access to these vaccine passports. So we're going to inject them into our hands so that we can walk around, we can take flights easier, and it's going to be so much easier. Um, and the wider trend of inserting the under the skin microchips contain personal information has developed over the past few years, gaining popularity in Sweden. 
People there began using the chips to gain access to their homes, offices, gyms, without any use of, uh, of their handheld keys. So here is NBC News um, covering this story in Sweden on these microchips. Watch. When Elias Brotberger goes to work, he doesn't need ID. And he doesn't need money. In fact, much of what he needs to get through the day is hidden right there, just below the surface in his hand. You like to touch it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, weird. Yeah, it's yeah. like a grain of rice. Yeah, a grain of rice. Embedded in his hand is a microchip that serves as his keys, his ID, and his wallet. Yeah, it's all in chip, so I use it like to get around the building. Buy snacks. Yeah, exactly. And she, and she says, yeah, hey, let's, for the fun of television, let's go buy some snacks. Then they go to the vending machines and he buys her some snacks and he's fine with that. And so are Swedes. Again, stop me if you know where this is going. Now we have the story from, from Sweden where chips implanted from Swedish, uh, Swedish developers are supporting digital health pass storage under your skin. So see how it slowly starts? Take a look at this. It slowly starts with the railway passage, then it goes to healthcare, and now it's going to be even more for vaccines. Um, and then again, here's the latest story overnight out of China, which is um, China unifying their health system. Basically, here's how Hong Kong's new China, uh, China-inspired health code would work. And the Chinese government now basically unifying all of their health databases so they'll be able to scan your vaccine passports and it instantly goes to the main central hub so they're able to track and know exactly everything that you're doing at all times. Um, would you guys opt for this? What do you guys think about this? <laughs> um, I mean, if you're in Sweden, maybe, right? I mean, yeah. I, I, it's, understands, I, it's understandable to me why the Swedes are okay with it because they have high level of trust in their government. Mm. And even when you yeah. look at the pandemic, Sweden was the pariah of the pandemic, right? Because they refused to go along with all of the lockdowns and the COVID passes. So um, yeah, I yeah. can understand why Swedes say, why not? You know, there's nothing to fear. Well, they might not have anything to fear with their government, but many of us do. The governments that were implementing mandates and saying you can't do xyz you can't we're, we're going under lockdown you're not allowed to travel and i even know in russia uh, i have some russian friends that when they went into lockdown they had qr codes that were installed on their phones and the qr code would indicate whether or not they were allowed to go a certain distance on the subway wow. so it because they had like restrictions on you could only go to work um, only if you worked in certain essential sectors and so they actually use those QR codes on their phones in order to restrict, you know, and people just were like, I guess I'm going to have to walk, you know, where I want to go. So, and you know that, of course, in many areas, if they had the ability to move to that digital pass on the phones, they would have done. I mean, they tried, they but it just didn't work out here in the United States. But yeah, I mean, obviously that's where that microchip is headed. But on the flip side, there's a lot of people who would love it. You know, people that are older, they can't remember their medical records when their doctors say, hey, what what medicines are you on? And what are your recent, you know, what have you done lately? And they're like, I don't know. Check my chip. I mean, yeah. I guess you could see that, right? Sure. I can see of all, all kinds of useful things if you trust the ecosystem. Um, and it's not just trusting the government of Sweden, though. We now know that all governments hack each other for the most part, right? We know that the United States hacks into the systems, the private systems, private phone records of people and uh, state heads of state in right. other countries. So, you know, if you're Swedish, that's fine, but you got better hope that the American government doesn't find an exploit for it because then they're gonna track you too. Well, I have so many questions too about like, okay, what's in these chips, right? We know, I mean, rare earth minerals that are, you know, we don't even, we don't even have recycling programs for them because they're so toxic. So we're gonna put that inside of our bodies. Right, I, mean, I wanna ask, remember our acupuncturist, Dr. Butler, who said, um, when I was pregnant, he said, you shouldn't wear the Apple watch because oh. of the frequency, like, can you imagine? <laughs> What, what oh, wow. an acupuncturist would say about like this sort grain of, of rice uh, that has. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> you know, my next thought went completely sci fi and thought, well, can it teach me Cantonese? Can it, you know, yeah. like the matrix I think that has to, has to be in your brain in right. order for them to do that. But I know they are working on that. They are working on microchips that would go in your brain. But again, you know, everything is always developed under this benevolent um, you know, for benevolent reasons, like, yes. well, we're going to put the microchip in your brain to help prevent Alzheimer's. 
so that sounds like a really good thing or to help you if you're epileptic or if you've got any sort of other neurological illnesses, then then maybe the microchip in your brain would help you. But yeah, you could definitely see where that technology could be used in a very sinister way that is extremely limiting. I mean, if you can if you can only pay for things using the microchip in your hand and the government doesn't want you to buy certain types of products, could you imagine? I mean, they just yeah. you get cut off. You get cut off and you can't do anything then. And this is why there's this movement back to cash. You know, I used to be very yeah. pro, hey, get rid of cash. You know, cash is trash. That used to be something I used to say because I'm a I'm an investor and I believe in, you know, in, in passive income and buying actual assets. But when the actual physical cash started to get vilified by governments, right? That there's COVID on their paper money. Don't use cash. Go to digital. Go contactless. There's a reason, right? And we started to see this come out of the World Health Organization. You started to see this consolidation of power around. In conjunction with these new tax laws that want you to report all transactions down to a $12 Venmo, right? right. Okay, mm -hmm. these things now and are she, very convenient. And she, even in that NBC piece, I don't know if you caught it, she said not, not even have to carry any cash at all. Like you don't have to carry any cash, nothing at all that you carry. It's all right in your wrist. It's a, you know, it's a government implanted chip that lets you do everything. I, to me, I say, hell no, <laughs> hell no. Give me my cash. I don't trust you guys at all. I know where this is going. Um, and it, to me, it's all a consolidation of power. I mean, the tracking, knowing where people are, uh, being able to find and monitor all of their transactions. Right, and I also just wouldn't want the first model right? Because yeah. of how technology <laughs> advances so much. Like, um, I don't know if you saw the man in Italy who, we have a picture here, but I put it in late. Can we pull it up on Clayton's laptop? Um, oh no, it's not there. The man who- There he is, yeah. Uh, yeah, who tattooed his QR code for his vaccine on his wrist, oh. it, uh, just to like be able to flash it around Europe. But those QR codes expire. When he did this, we didn't know that at the time. And so now he's got an expired QR code for his vaccine <laughs> oh on his, as a permanent tattoo, right? So um, that would be another one of my concerns is like, these things will be updated. Oh, that's unbelievable. Um, yeah, let us know in the chat what you would do with your vaccine data on microchips. Would you do it? Would you not? Let us know in the con comments below. I mean, there are other ways. You know, and all the sci-fi movies have been on retinal scan, which is then like not implanted, but... You see, I've gone but full sci-fi on just, this. You know, or even if it's your th your fingerprint, you know, even if they don't have to, like you're saying, like retinal scan or like a thumbprint type thing, it's all very, to, to move to that sort of system where it's connected to your body is obviously really high, highly problematic. But of course, they're going to try to do it because during the COVID pandemic, when people were ne needing to use their vaccine passports, people were faking them. And yes. the government knows that they were cracking down on those fake, you know, uh, cards Right. And so I would imagine that they are trying to figure out how do we prevent people from being able to do that, which is scary, very then, scary. But then I hope at the same time that you manage to prevent hacking, you know, of the of these uh, people's health data, banking data, yeah. like my chip was hacked. Oh, we need to send you a new chip. Oh, that means I need to get it another injection. I need to take yeah. the old one out. And no, put they the take it out like in <laughs> Stranger Things. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where she just... She, uh, like 11. I would, think, I would hope 11. more like Total yeah. Recall. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Oh, yeah. Total Recall where they pull the... Thing. <laughs> so oh, uh, David did put up a poll. Uh, sorry, David did put up a in uh, in chat uh, asking, would you allow the government to microchip you for convenience? And of uh, 2,200 votes, we had 2% of them that were yes. 2% uh, that depends on where they stick it. And 95% are hell no. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that 2% vote, Dr. Fauci. We're glad yeah. you're watching. Well, <laughs> well, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to say just thanks to thanks to Kim Iverson for joining us. Um, where can people find uh, all of the work that you're doing these days and, and free free of corporate media? Yeah, well, right now I am post, well, as, as free of corporate media as I could possibly be being on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can find me on YouTube. Um, I'm right now posting Monday through Thursday uh, at KimIversonShow.com. So that is where you can find my segments for now. But that'll be changing. But as it does, I'll be letting everybody know through my YouTube channel. So and that's also where you can find my other information, like my newsletter and any other platforms that I'm on and 
and uh, joining my locals community and whatnot. It's all there in the descriptions of my YouTube videos. So KimIversonShow.com. Well, oh, congratulations awesome. on it. Uh, Thank you. I know you're still, you've got a heartbreak over it, but I hope there's a lot of momentum for you to um, build something that's onward and upward and, you know, the, the sky's the limit. Thank you. Well, and thanks to all of you for subscribing and pushing us. Like I said, we're getting close to a million subscribers here on the channel. Um, so please subscribe to the channel and uh, we will have a little we have a little party. We'll have a million uh, a million subscriber party. Um, and uh, we just we couldn't do it without all of you. So thank you so much for subscribing to the channel. Don't forget um, to subscribe to our daily newsletter. Um, every morning it's published. Uh, go to redacted.inc is the place to get it. That's the website, not .com. It's .inc, redacted.inc. And you'll get a welcome email. It'll come from me, Clayton, at redacted.inc is the email. So make sure you put it into your favorites because, you know, Gmail does all this crazy stuff now. <laughs> Last week they were telling us, someone was telling us before we made the move over on the server that it was that Google or Gmail had listed it as dangerous. Yeah, we're not dangerous. <laughs> Our newsletter is dangerous. <laughs> No, because we're actually we're telling benevolent. the truth. We're pretty benevolent. So we're not like a microchip in your hand. So anyway, just make sure you add us to your contacts. That way you get the newsletter without problems. So that'll be first thing tomorrow. Um, thank you everyone for subscribing. And we will see you back here tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Have a great night, everyone.